Ros needs no, no introduction. Um, but I guess we really ought to try and cast our mind back to when you, when you were f first coming into pensions. I think the first time I came across you in pensions was in, in the Miners Review. Yeah. So could you remind us what it was in the Miners Review that you did and why you got involved in that? Well, uh, my whole career has been on pensions one way or another. I started off as an academic on pensions. My PhD was on pensions. Then I managed pension fund money in the city. And then when I had my third child, I took some time out and decided to go back in doing consultancy work. And one of the friends that I had uh, was working at Gartmoor. Paul Miners had decided to take on this role for Gordon Brown, a major review of institutional investment. And suddenly the takeover that he was supposed to have been uh, negotiating to free up his time fell through. So within about a few hours of me having lunch with this chap, Paul Miners had called me up and said, could you come and set up this review that I've promised Gordon Brown? And so I set, set up the various work streams, and the ones I was particularly involved in uh, were the MFR and a strand on annuities, and then the whole investment process within DB and, and the trend towards DC. So it really was a, a major overhaul or, or investigation into how, at the end of the 1990s, DB pension funds were investing and what the trends were likely to be. And it was around about then that we had the justice for pensions and ASW movement. And that, that was what really brought you to public prominence, I think. Well, that kind of catapulted me. I was already doing television and radio on pension issues on behalf of either the Treasury or then Number 10 because most people in those days didn't really know much about pensions, but there was a lot going on. So I had been working with the Treasury and then Number 10 heard about some of the work I'd done on the social aspects of pensions. And one of, one of the things that had suddenly uh, hit home with me was that the MFR, after Maxwell, wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing. And you couldn't rely on it, even though the government said you could, and everyone in their scheme believed they were now safe. That wasn't the case. Uh, and what had happened was that I started doing some talks on the problems of the MFR, and we had FRS 17 that came in at the same time, so just looking at whether it was reliable or not. And Panorama asked me to go down to South Wales the week after Allied Steel and Wire failed, and the workforce there, these, these steel workers, discovered that they'd lost their pensions, and they were in complete turmoil. You know, it was a really awful situation. And Panorama wanted to make a program of it. And I guess they were looking for somebody who could help try and explain to the workforce and was seen as quasi-official. And I was really worried what, what I'd find when I went down there, because I imagined all these furious steel workers, you know, who'd be blaming anyone in sight. But when I got down there, I was struck by how dignified they were and what amazing people. I mean, these were the people, I, I always said, who made Britain great. You know, they had just had the most terrible shock and what I considered was a real injustice done to them. Many of them were in their 60s, not far away from retirement. Their whole life savings was in here. And of course, in those days, if you wanted to save extra money over and above what your DB scheme would give you. The law required you to put all of the money into the scheme too, and in terms of ABCs or extra years. So they'd lost everything, even their private savings, as well as their employer pension, plus some of their state pension was in there because the scheme was contracted out, so they lost their GMP bit. And I just thought, this is unbelievable. And I was waiting for them to sort of come up to me really angry and saying, who can I blame? Who can, whose fault is it? Who can I sue? And the question that I kept getting asked was, how can I find a job? Yeah. You 
know, these men were proud. They didn't want to go on benefits. They wanted to still support their families. They'd had a, you know, a lifetime in hard steel-working jobs, some of them not as healthy as they might have wanted to be. And it was then that I realized there was something terribly wrong here. And if there was anything I could do to try and, number one, help them, but number two, try and stop it happening to other people, I really did need to try and do something. Yeah, I, I must say, having spent some time in Port Talbot uh, a couple of years yeah. ago, uh, I recognize what you say about steel men. Um, and of course, this led, disastrous and horrible as it was, uh, to some good, didn't it? Well, the first thing that happened was that, you know, I went back and I started explaining to Tony Blair and the policy unit there what was going on here. And immediately, Blair said, well, we can't let this happen. We've got to sort it. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't a very good relationship between number 10 and number 11. And Blair sort of went over to Gordon and said, look, this is going on. We can't let this happen. And Gordon said, well, it's all the fault of the trustees or it's the fault of the employers. And he, I felt, thought that maybe they were people who had their own houses and could, could sell their house and live on that. Let's not undermine the whole pension system. And can you keep quiet about it, please, because it's going to rock confidence. Well, Tony wasn't very happy with that answer. And within number 10, we set up a working stream to try and figure out how we could protect pensions in the way that politicians had always promised they would be protected after Maxwell. And of course, the unions became involved, and that's when Gordon started to take more notice. And we, we started working on how you could introduce pension protection in reality rather than relying on a funding standard that may or may not work depending on the markets. Because we just, you know, obviously in 2000 you'd had the crash and the dot com bust and everything. So we did some work looking at the PBGC in America, which had already set it up, and some of the other countries where there was much better proper protection, insurance type arrangements. And we got the legislation started for the Pension Protection Fund. So that ensured that from, well, we had the 2003 uh, consultation, 2004 Pensions Act, and at that stage, we knew we'd have the PPF to make sure that this would not happen to more schemes in future. Unfortunately, since the 2001 time when I became aware of schemes failing, and 2002 when it was ASW, so many more schemes failed, hundreds of schemes failed. And sometimes the employer was walking away because the law only required you to pay enough to meet the MFR. And the MFR was wholly inadequate to buy annuities for all your scheme members. And the priority order required you to buy annuities first for anyone who'd already uh, take, started taking their pension. And in, for example, the ASW case, you had top directors who were in their 50s, who had secured their pensions with annuities, fully inflation protected, and you had the steel workers who had 40 years service in the scheme, who were in their 60s, whose money was being used to buy the annuities for the others. So, you know, it was clear we needed to do something, and the protection of the pension protection fund was introduced, and the regulatory protection to try and stop employers just walking away without meeting their liabilities. Uh, you had a lot of venture capital firms at the time who had figured out this wheeze. So your employer didn't have to go bust to rob you or strip you of your pension. He just had to pay in enough money to meet the MFR and that was it. The legal obligations were done. And it wasn't just the PPF, was it? Because the PPF's a forward-looking thing. You, you were also looking at backward-looking elements. And uh, you involved with FAS? My first introduction to the evils of political spin was when in 2004, alongside the work we were doing on 
the Pension Protection Fund, the Treasury announced that it was introducing a financial assistance scheme to make sure that the people whose pensions were lost in the past would be compensated. And it sounded marvellous. £400 million over the next 20 years to sort the problem out. <laughs> now, any actuary will, will know immediately that, first of all, there was no inflation linking, so it was just £40 million. If it's £20 million a year and it wasn't all front-loaded, and you had 100,000 people who'd lost out, they weren't going to get much to replace the pension they'd lost. And what happened was, I had to start doing some analysis to try and explain to the media, who saw 400 million sounded great, thought, oh, that's all done, and the MPs as well, that actually it was going to help maybe four or five percent of those who'd lost out and might restore a small bit of their pension, but certainly wouldn't give them anything that they were expected. And most people would get nothing. And that was really hard because on the one hand, you had the government wanting to say this is all done and dusted. And then I had personally known all these people, some of whom, you know, were not well. They were terminally ill or, you know, widows whose husbands had already died and who, who were just waiting with nothing. And I felt I couldn't turn my back on them. But it was really tough. And at, at the beginning... A lot of people in the pensions industry wanted it to go away. But to, the, to its credit, after a while, when the industry realized what was going on, they started supporting it. Then we got political support. And we got the PPF, which was great. And then I truly believed that the Labour administration would ultimately see these people right. And unfortunately turned out that there wasn't any intention to do that. Part of the reason, I believe, was that equitable life was coming behind. Yeah. And the Treasury was adamant that it had no sympathy for anyone in equitable life. They were all supposedly middle-class people who'd lost out, and it was hard luck. And to be fair, the wrong um, perpetrated against the equitable life people wasn't quite as extreme as those people who had literally lost all their life savings and all their pension. But of course there was a wrong, and the Treasury didn't want to get involved in the FAS situation for fear that the equitable life would come behind, and that was far more money. So uh, they did get involved in the equitable life, or equitable life. They did have to do more in regard to FAS, uh, do you feel that you were responsible for improving, if you like, the lot of those people? Did you manage to get your way? Were you influential, Ros? I cannot tell you how hard it was, but it was a, a battle that I couldn't believe we would lose, but at many times it looked as if we would, and I can't tell you how many pensions ministers we had to go and see, and secretaries of state at the DWP we had to go and see, each one trying to explain again. Once I realised that Gordon Brown had absolutely no intention of, of doing the right thing here, we organised uh, an appeal to the parliamentary ombudsman. That was a huge amount of work. The parliamentary ombudsman found in favour of these individuals and said the government should fully restore the lost pensions because the government had assured them that their money was safe and they believed it and it wasn't true and the government had designed the MFR which it turned out was only originally designed to give them a 50-50 chance of getting their full pension but nobody told them that um, and for the first time a government turned around to the ombudsman and said we don't agree and we're not going to do what you say I mean, this is like the referee on the pitch who says, you know, you've got a red card and, and, and the player just says, oh, sorry, I disagree. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm staying. I mean, it really was unbelievable. So then I had to mount a judicial review, find lawyers who could work no win, no fee, to take on this case and try and force the government to obey its parliamentary ombudsman's ruling. 
We won in the High Court, and the government appealed. And so we had to go to the Court of Appeal, and the government kept refusing to underwrite these, the costs if we lost. So we had to fundraise. I mean, I was involved in things I never dreamed I would be. I was always the pensions expert who understood pensions and could help explain it to people. Suddenly, I was a campaigner trying to force government to do something that I thought automatically it would realize it needed to do. Anyway, we won in the Court of Appeal, and at that stage, finally, 2007, the uh, government agreed. It was actually Peter Hayne, the Secretary of State, Mike O'Brien, who was the pensions minister, agreed that the <coughs> FAS would mirror the PPF. And there was no political support for more than that. And finally, we had a deal. And we could just then focus on getting it set up and working rather than fighting. And that, that was a wonderful, wonderful day as far as I was concerned, because it has kind of taken over my life. Yeah, it reminds me very much of something that Sam was saying in the last session. You weren't there for it, but he, he said today he felt that he ought to find a solution in the middle, but he ended up finding that the solution wasn't in the middle. And in your case, you, I guess, assumed that justice was, was what you get from government, but you found it wasn't coming from government. I was, I was really disheartened that it took so long and was so difficult to actually get the government to do the right thing. Um, but in the end, justice prevailed. I, I kept not being able to believe it wouldn't, but a lot of people kept saying, why are you doing this? Why are you beating your head against the wall? They're never going to do it. And I just couldn't believe they wouldn't. And I also couldn't turn my back on the people who had been so wronged. Yeah. And your, your legacy is fast, and your legacy is PPF, and I guess a fairer settlement for the equitable life people. Yeah. Um, let's move on a little bit in history. Um, you also became a fierce critic of the way in which annuities were being, dare I say it, sold to people. I think that was the mis way you put it. Or missold to people. Um, or misbought. Misbought. And I, I guess nowadays we look back at the days when people bought annuities or misbought annuities with some sense of nostalgia almost as we see uh, the, 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 the way in which the pension freedoms are working out in some cases. Um, but, you know, cast your mind back to 2012, 13, 14. What was the problem and, what, and why were you so adamant about it? Well, funnily enough, it, it was the annuity work that Number 10 particularly wanted me to do. That was back in 2001. And at that stage, it was clear that there were problems with the way the annuities were being sold. Uh, of course, the rates were much better. It's just that some people with very poor health or, or terminal illnesses were getting a standard annuity rate, which was clearly not suitable for them, and they didn't know. Uh, but it took, you know, 10 years later, like you say, 2001, uh, 2011, 2012, and thereafter, the problem we had was that we had had QE. So the Bank of England had been forcing down interest rates at the long end, and that's how annuities are priced. So after a succession of falls in the pension that you would get for life from your pension fund, you still had people being, if you like, herded into not even inflation-linked annuities, but level annuities, not even joint life annuities. So you had widows who, whose husbands had been terminally ill, had bought this standard annuity not knowing what, what on earth it was, uh, or they weren't with a company that, that sold uh, impaired life annuities, because they were relatively a new thing, who were left with nothing. So the value that you got in annuities had, had decreased. Annuities were never that popular anyway, once, once people realized what was going on. You had a campaign in the industry which said you need to find the best rate. But of course, what the campaign never helped people understand was you needed the best rate for the right annuity, not just the best rate, which was going to be a single life level annuity, obviously, unless you were in the impaired life market, which most companies weren't. So. I am not someone who thinks that the pension freedoms per se are terrible. I think they're wonderful. And I think the reforms that went alongside those in terms of making pensions 
IHT free and getting rid of a 55% death tax charge, for example, are brilliant. Behaviorally, they are absolutely what you want. But the problem with the pension freedoms is that although the Treasury intended that everybody alongside the freedoms would get access to free guidance to help them understand what was the best thing for them to do, they haven't got there. Pension-wise, it doesn't really reach many people. The take-up is incredibly low. And what you really needed, actually, uh, with hindsight, is a pension-wise service for the annuity market before people bought the wrong annuity at the wrong rate at the wrong time or whatever like that. But we never had it. However, I do think that unless and until we have automatic uh, guidance for everybody that's auto-enrollment into some kind of guidance and ideally financial advice as well, we won't make the pension freedoms work in the way they should and could. And we also haven't got any control on the charges and costs and no transparency on the charges and costs of the drawdown products. So you've got a lot of people who've built up a pension pot, which is fine, who are taking money out of that pot, probably too much too soon, many of them paying unnecessary tax, who are not going to have money left in their 80s and 90s, even though they should, because the system isn't helping them to understand what they should and could be doing, rather than, in my view, because the, the system itself is entirely wrong. Some people do need a regular income for life. Everybody will want to have extra on top of the state pension, because the state pension isn't clearly isn't going to be enough to live on in retirement. And there's a program tonight, uh, 7.30 on ITV, which will show you know, the inadequacies of just trying to live on the state pension, for example. Featuring you. I was, I was there helping people understand what they might have to live on. We're trying to make them live on it for a, for, well, for a I, week. I'm, I've already set my TV so that I get playback when I get off the party. <laughs> At two o'clock in the morning, I'm going to be watching you. Uh, you must uh, have better things to do with your time, Henry. Now, question for you. This is very relevant to the group of people here. Um, financial education is hard to deliver uh, unless there's some kind of organization. Do you see the workplace as a good place to deliver that financial education? It's the ideal place. And auto-enrollment is the ideal vehicle. If I was designing auto-enrollment, what I would do would be to mandate that any provider of workplace auto-enrollment pensions must also include financial education in its offering. And that you should be able to distinguish your pension offering for the workplace by the quality of the engagement that you can engender with the workforce. HR departments would want to be able to promote good financial education. Many of them are doing it already. But actually, I think it sits naturally with the idea that people are having money taken out of their pension, uh, their salary every week or every month. Their employer is putting money in as well. Hopefully, the government is putting some money in on top of that. And not always. And yet, the worker doesn't really know what, the, what, what on earth is going on. The fact that the minimum auto-enrollment is nowhere near enough to give them a great lifestyle on top of whatever the state will give them, and how they can plan to do more, look at the financial planning uh, tools that are available, or you know, have access to the kind of education and engagement that naturally belongs with and alongside the auto-enrollment program, which is just a, a start for you. You mentioned uh, almost everyone is going to get the promised. Now, I, I have to be very careful about using the word government incentive because um, those were words which somebody, I think it may just have been you, took out um, of the uh, DWP's, uh, TPR's uh, explanation well, of what was to, going on. Because it wasn't true. 
Now, can you explain this? Because not everybody understands this net pay anomaly thing, which I think you're getting at. Yeah, I mean, what I discovered when I was minister was that the auto-enrolment program was built on the, the assumption that you would be able to tell everyone in the workplace, if you put money into your pension, the employer will put money in as well, and you'll get extra from other taxpayers. So you put your money in, and you get free money from your employer and the taxman. Now, that's quite an attractive selling point, really, for most people, you'd think. What I discovered, though, was that, sadly, it wasn't actually true. Because there will be some people, uh, indeed the lowest earners, who you would argue need the most help to build up a better pension, who are getting the employer money, but they're not getting the government incentive. But even worse than that, they're paying it themselves. So the money's still going into their pension, but if their employer is using a net pay arrangement, they're not getting the tax relief that they would get if their employer was using a relief at source scheme. And a lot of people are wholly unaware of this situation. So what I decided we needed to do first was make sure because what, what, the, what the regulator had on its website was materials that employers could use to market, if you like, or explain to their workforce what was happening in their auto-enrollment pension scheme. And some of the standard templates and letters that went out said, you will get a contribution from your employer and the tax man. Well, that's not true. So with my past experience, I could see that there was a a valid potential claim against the government. You told me, the regulator told me, that the, the, my employer used the regulator's standard letters that told me I'd be getting government money, and I didn't. Where is it? Um, you know, the frightening thing uh, is that a lot of employers, and I'm not going to be asking the audience this, uh, don't know whether their DC scheme is net pay or relief at source, and don't know whether or not they've got uh, employees who aren't getting this government incentive, which doesn't really exist, or not. So uh, just a note for the audience, it might be worth you having a word uh, with our DC team, and they'll be able to tell you uh, whether or not you're getting uh, uh, the net pay anomaly uh, at work, because there could be a risk down the line uh, that some of your staff just don't get what they've been promised or think they're getting, and, and that can't be very nice for you as an employer. So, there, um, I mean, there is a risk of a class action at some point, I would have thought. It's, it only applies if you've got anyone in your workforce who earns less than £12,500 a year, because that's where the tax threshold has been increased to. So if you don't have any low earners, it's fine. But if you do, then there may be an issue that you want to think about. It's not a lot of money, uh, and indeed, you know, if you've got one low earner and loads of people in the scheme, you might want to you know, pay £60 a year for that person. That's fine, but it's just a question of knowing about it. And it comes back to this thing about fairness. Now, I'd like to move on to something which, which has always puzzled me. And I, I want to ask you this very straightforwardly. Yeah? I believe that when you were uh, first approached to be in government by David Cameron, he actually offered you a quite different job than the one that you ended up getting. Can you actually explain these strange circumstances pre and post the 2015 election and how you ended up being pensions minister? Well, um, it will come out in my book one day, but <laughs> I had always been an independent. I'd never been particularly party political. I'd worked with all parties, and, and I was the independent expert. It never in my wildest dreams occurred to me that I might be in government as a minister. Never. I suddenly got this call while I was on the train coming back, on the Eurostar, coming back from Paris. Uh, it's George Osborne's office here. Uh, could you speak to the Chancellor? Okay. So I get on the phone, and he says, David and I have been talking. Bear in mind, this was in the middle of the 2015 election campaign. It was about, 
I don't know, three weeks before the election or four weeks before the election. And he said, David and I have been talking and we would like to see if you'd like to be a minister if the Tories form the next government. Hello. So I was just like taken aback, but as one does, I just said, uh, well, could I have a bit, you know, oh, first I said, well, I have no, absolutely no desire to stand as an MP, thank you very much, because I never would. Oh, no, 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 we'd put you in the House of Lords. You'd be a minister from the House of Lords. Okay. Again, like, jaw on the floor moment. Uh, then they said, well, could, could you come in tomorrow morning to Downing Street to discuss it with us? So I said, fine, hung up. I was going off to meet my husband. It was his birthday, and we were going out for dinner. And I, I said, you won't believe the conversation I've just had. I told him, he said, oh, don't be stupid, it's a wind-up. <laughs> <laughs> so when I went in next morning, I really wasn't sure if they'd be expecting me in Downing Street at all, because it hadn't occurred to me. But I thought, well, that was the most likely explanation, actually. Anyway, I got in there, and they said to me, we would like to offer you the job of pensions minister if we form the next government. And I said, absolutely no, thank you. I had no desire to be pensions minister. I knew that there were poison chalices waiting for me. I had no desire to oversee the increase in women's state pension age and the new state pension, because that was all done and dusted. And I'd actually campaigned against the uh, increase in women's state pension age and tried to persuade the government not to do it. Anyway, they said, well, what would you like to do? And I'd always wanted to do consumer financial education and protection, because that's kind of fits very well with the kind of things I think were missing from the pensions landscape. So we worked it all out. They put out a press release saying, Ros Altman has decided to join uh, the campaign to support the Tories at the next election. And if we form a government, she, has, she will be the minister within the Treasury for consumer financial education and protection. It was all, all done and dusted. It was fine. Come the election, the Tories win an outright majority, which we never expected. So the idea was Steve Webb would probably still be pensions minister. It would be a coalition if they did win. And actually, at the time I joined, it looked like they weren't going to win anyway. So it was all a surprise. I, before I, I got my phone call from Cameron to say, you know, come in and talk about being a minister, it had been announced on Twitter that David Gork was pensions minister. So again, it never occurred to me that I was being called into Downing Street to be offered the job of pensions minister. But that's what happened. I'm sitting opposite Cameron, and he said, Ros, we've decided we want to make you pensions minister. I said, but I told you. I, no, first I said, but, but it's David Gork. Oh, no, no, that was a mistake. He's at the Treasury. I said, but I told you, I, I really don't want to be pensions minister. No, we really need you to. We hadn't expected to win, and we've got no one else. So I said, look. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, why don't we split the state pension and have a minister for private pensions sitting in the Treasury, which I'd love to do, and just leave state pensions in the DWP where it kind of belongs anyway? No, 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 that's not really what we want. I said, please, you know, I, that's, that's kind of what I'd really like to do. So Cameron promised to talk to George about it, but in the meantime, would I agree to be pensions minister? <laughs> Well, I fell for that one, and I was pensions minister, which I, I must say was an incredible experience. You know, it really was an amazing and very different, um, very different from anything I'd ever done before. Uh, becoming uh, supposedly a politician was itself a baptism of fire, but then just working within the DWP where decisions aren't made because they are pretty much made in the Treasury, and realizing firsthand the difference between the attitude of the DWP to pensions and the attitude of the Treasury. You know, Treasury pensions are a cost. You know, it's a bit like, you know, a DB scheme. The finance director will see tr pensions as a cost. In the DWP, pensions are a benefit, like the HR director. And that's a very, very different mindset. Uh, but to be fair, I, you know, I did work on auto-enrollment, which I really was very pleased to be able to keep on the road, because there, was, there were two occasions when it was nearly absolutely canned, 
and I think that would have been dreadful. It would have been a real travesty. Uh, and you know, we we did look at pensions tax reform in detail. In the end, it was decided politically with Brexit coming up. It was just too risky to take top rate tax relief away from lots of people at a time when the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph were campaigning vehemently against it. Uh, and it wasn't something that we, I thought, had thought through carefully enough. You know, we, we did need to look in the round at, at the whole pensions tax landscape and national insurance and the whole thing. And we had expected that the Office for Tax Simplification would be producing a report, which one would, would make sense to dovetail with. But uh, anyway, Brexit happened, and that's all history now. So. I, I, I'm tentatively right, going to just move the conversation away from Brexit, because I, I think we know where your views are on that. Uh, this is, it never actually, it's like talking about Man United against Man City or Liverpool. So it just ends in tears. Um, I hope it won't. No. <laughs> I hope, well, as far as we can see, uh, it's ending in tears. But um, I'd like to come back to this, this question, which, which is a kind of personal one. You probably had more stick yeah, than most in, in this industry. And you've always seemed resilient. Nobody's ever seen you riled or losing your rag or whatever. Um, how do you do it? How do you stay <laughs> so thick-skinned? <laughs> calm. Calm. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> well... I don't actually think I am that thick-skinned, and it's one of the reasons why I've been so uncomfortable being a politician, because you have to take a lot of criticism. But with the pensions work that, that, that I've done, and when I have had to battle to get people to see what's going on, or, or to see if there's something wrong, how to put it right, I've always been driven by this kind of underlying sense of social justice, and, you know, that... that Somehow or other, if you can see that something is really wrong, you can't just give up and leave it to everybody else. And my father always instilled in me this, this idea that you've got to help people if you can. And the, the phrase that's often driven me, you know, the old Edmund Burke saying, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to be silent. And the temptation to just be quiet, turn a blind eye, look after your own career. I mean, it, you know, when I was campaigning against the government, it cost me a lot of uh, potential work because the easiest thing to do would be to trot along behind the government and say, oh, gosh, thank you for that financial assistance scheme. Even though I knew it wouldn't help people, we would have got, you know, the government would have got away with it because if I'd said it was okay... Uh, then who was going to fight? Who was going to be there taking up the charge? The people didn't have any money to pay anyone with. So if someone wasn't actually doing it, and it was that, it's kind of that sense of justice that, that I think gives you the ability to keep going even when your back's against the wall and you feel that maybe you never will get through. You've got to believe that you will eventually.